So what's, <laughs> what's this topic? What are we talking about this time? Misconceptions about FRC. Oh, yeah. Good one. And like, yeah, I guess that's good. I mean, mobility training in general, misconceptions. Well, I guess, you know, mobility training is a really large I think we could talk branch about branch of families of. Yeah, I don't even want to talk about mobility training per se. I mean, we could say like mobility training like has been bastardized and like what is mobility or I don't even know if we need to go down that road. We, I think we could talk more about like what FR, more about FRC and like how we use it and what, what that entails versus what we see on social media. Um, we could also just talk about like the villainization of systems in general you know like there's like this big movement out there where people are like fuck a system if there's a system it's a fucking scam to take your money like you know because that's like that's the vibe yeah well I don't know I mean I feel like with all things like the when you're you're new at something you know you tend to gravitate towards these answers you know like this is the way kind of a thing the way that you need to do anything and then the older or more experience you get with the thing you realize like we could talk, uh, there's be, so many ways to do a thing you know it'd be fun to talk about that like our experience like we got into CrossFit and it was like CrossFit is something that everybody should be doing and it's going to save humanity because it's going to make everybody so fit and healthy right but then we could talk about like you know, we just changed Kool-Aid flavors is what you're saying or well yeah we should say that so it's like yeah now we're bought into this other system but like the biggest difference is that it shows you it really like if you really learn about it like it really just shows you that, that like what the fuck do you want to do like there's nothing that's good or bad there's just preparing your body for it or not yeah so maybe misconception number one so if you think about like mobility training in general and all of the uh mobility training systems you know like there's yoga you could probably stick pilates in there in some in some senses it isn't but in other senses it is a lot of full range training so it's good for developing or maintaining range of motion uh in a way um there's you know the classic like i don't want to name names and be a, you know a jerk to people but there's lots of mobility programs out there and then you know then there's like the functional range conditioning trainer branch but it, it's not like mobility in some ways is a bad word um because people just think like the only thing that you're trying to do with mobility training is get more flexible, which, you know, they, they kind of go into it in their seminar. It's like, it's not about getting flexible because flexibility is just bendiness. Bendiness isn't any better than stiffness. You have to be able to actually do something with your range of motion in order for it to be useful. Um, but then that's what I love so much about this last seminar is it was kind of more of an integration into like practical application in a training atmosphere and that really what it is is it's just training you know it's a different input you know if you if you do strength and conditioning which most of our followers because that's what we do they're doing strength and conditioning it's a it's that's a system but it doesn't address whatsoever developing range of motion um, you know you'll get some like odd effects of moving into a full depth squat you know but is that the best way to develop the range of motion of your hips is to just do you know rely on things like stiff like a deadlifts and ass to grass back squats to develop your mobility no kipping pull-ups to develop your shoulder mobility no and i said a while ago like in a post people get really confused i'm totally rambling sorry people get really confused here. about the difference between something that you use to develop your mobility, develop range of motion versus something that you use to express the range of motion that you have. And like a kipping pull up is an example of something like, oh yeah, this is gonna be great for my shoulder mobility because like I'm just ramming myself into this shoulder flexion like repeatedly or I'm gonna hang to develop my shoulder mobility, which is kind of on the fringe for me. But uh, it's not, you're not gonna develop it that way, you might, but you're also really likely to hurt yourself trying to use something like that that expresses mobility, like a Cossack, you know, I'm gonna do a deep ass Cossack squat to develop my adductor flexibility. No, like develop your adductor flexibility safely and then just go fucking express it in a Cossack. Okay. Yeah, okay, no, that's okay, that's okay, because <laughs> that, that made me think of a couple things, like, 
<laughs> I can tell you're over here going like right this. Right, it's, it's ready to explode. Um, yeah, like that. It's it's hard. I mean, I feel like with all this stuff in general, like we can't talk in really any absolutes, in my opinion, about this training stuff, with the exception of you you have to have some base level of some prerequisites for shit to work. So like, there's lots of people who've had really good shoulder improvements hanging on a pull up bar. There's a lot of people who haven't had good results doing that. It's fucked their shoulders up or made them feel worse. And so it's one of those things like <laughs> it always just depends. Like if you have enough rotational capacity in your shoulder and maybe the one movement in your shoulder that's very stiff and limited is shoulder flexion, you could be a good candidate for getting some improvement by hanging from doing that because you're loading a range of motion that's tight that you kind of have those baseline. And you're baseline. already strong. You're not overweight. Yeah, you have those baseline functions. So it's always like even when I've made posts about hanging for shoulder mobility or not, you know, it's always hard. Like hanging is a really cool thing that your shoulders can do. And it is good for your shoulders to do it if you have that base level of capacity. It's just now it just comes down to how are you going to determine what that base level is? Like we follow functional range conditioning stuff because it gives you a a simple way to look at a joint and see does it have these baseline functions and what's appropriate for that shoulder to do. That makes it really easy to see if, yeah, you should hang, you probably shouldn't hang. Maybe you need to develop a little more external rotation first. Um, it's, uh, it's tough though. Yeah. So what I really like about it though, is that it, it's, you know, and I think where the misconceptions are a lot of the time with folks is that they look at it and they go, Oh, these guys think they invented this shit. Like, I've been around the block, you know, I'm a ther therapist or whatever, you know, people, their education, they glance at it quickly and they say, oh, these guys are just repackaging. This isn't new. Like this is just some blah, blah, blah. Oh, that's just PNF stretching. Like they're not really actually looking at what's happening and what's being stated. These guys are not saying that they have reinvented the wheel. They're just saying that they fucking discovered tires. You know, it's like, oh, that makes this wheel way better. <laughs> well, I mean... This like, is like how to use this stuff, like looking at the research, this is our interpretation of it, you know, and this is how you would implement this stuff and use it. Yeah. And really like system. what works for training. Well, we know all these things work for training. Passive flexibility is really important. Loading stuff is really important. Concentric contractions, eccentrics, all of these things that are, have really been used forever to make people strong and change the way that our bodies work. Like that's what FRC encompasses. It's using those components. It just has a, a very direct way of looking at stuff to figure out what's appropriate when and when and when to do those things to develop whatever you need like do you need do you need to just make this joint have the base level functions that it needs to do more stuff well then it's easy to determine that maybe you got a really high level person who has all of the mobility that they need but you want to figure out how to make them stronger in a way that's sustainable you can use these same principles for that it's really just this lovely way of plugging and playing but it's hard though because in the like the vibe in social media is if something is called a system, people are like, it's a scam that's there to take your money and everybody's trying to come up with this proprietary thing that's better than everybody else. I mean, to me, like, just the fact that you go to an FRC seminar and they're like, we didn't create all this shit. We're not the geniuses who did all the work. Like, we're literally compiling all the information that's been created and researched by really smart people and just putting it together in a system that makes it easy to follow like that that gives a lot of credibility to me because it's not like many of these other things it's really just like we're better than everybody else and we figured this out because we're smarter and something. they're not telling Shit. you to stop doing anything that you're doing like they're not saying like this is the only thing that you need to do from now on what they're saying is that like they're basically organizing um organizing this information into a process, which is like, you have to learn to analyze movement prerequisites of this person's activities to determine what kind of range of motion they need. You know, if they, if you're going to just throw somebody in strength and conditioning and say, as long as you follow these tenets of perfect form, you're not going to hurt yourself. That's total bullshit because you look at, you know, one guy who has zero hip, anything like his hips are so damn tight. Uh, and then some other, you know, chick that's a runner or whatever, you know, and she's got amazing hip mobility, uh, you know, her doing good technique, probably great. This guy doing perfect technique, he's going to blow his back up or his hip or something because he just doesn't have that form. So anyways, look, you know, look for that and then assess the deficits, train the deficits, and then it all works through the deepest tissues first to the superficial tissues. So there's just a system of analysis of looking at 
you know, comparing what's this person trying to do. Okay, well, what do they need to be able to do this thing? Makes perfect fucking sense. I mean, this isn't like, again, it's not reinventing the wheel. It's not telling you to stop doing anything. It's just like, hey, have you thought to check this before you just start training somebody? Whoa. No, like I just want them to just just do this thing. Like, oh, come and, come and do my little routine I have. You know, like it's not really that beneficial to somebody. Um, so I, you have to analyze that stuff, you know, and, and then it's the process of like, stop trying to just do a fucking split to have better hip mobility. Like that's the superficial tissue, like go deep too, or first, like if you have tension on, in all those deeper tissues are super tight, it's not going to be that beneficial for you to just loosen up all the superficial stuff. You have to go all the way down in there. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's hard too, because you know, like what you see on social media a lot, I think where a, a lot of criticism comes from is people see they're showing cars. They're showing like these kind of base level FRC things that we're starting with that are foundational things, but that are a very small component of the training versus what you may need to do to really fix a shoulder and make it work well or develop a high level shoulder that can do lots of cool strength stuff or whatever you want to do. In our little world that we're in, like most of the work that we're doing with people is helping them regain basic human functions so they can go do those things. I mean, they're, they may be a high level lifter somebody who's super strong, but they, they have problems. They have a 400 pound bench press, but their shoulder hurts every time they bench and when they put their shirt on. And so the world that we're in is really like, it's in our heads to talk about like this base level joint function. And this is how you regain that. These are how we train those things. But I think what that looks like from the outside is like, Oh, this is all this is. This is just, doing shoulder cars is FRC. That's, that's not important because we all know what it takes to make a shoulder really strong. You got to load the shit out of it. You got to do these movements. You have to do all this stuff. That's hard work. I think the message, it's easy to mix the message up because that is, yeah. I mean, like if you want to develop that 400 pound bench press with some shoulders that are going to last, you need to develop those human functions. And that may look like more regressed work compared to what you're doing, but it's, it's not, it just looks different. It's like all of those principles that we use for bench press, very focused on this one little specific part of the body. Yeah. And people hammer away and spend all of this time building this massive muscular engine to push a bar off of their chest, but they haven't ever trained their shoulder capsule. They don't train the rotational musculature around the shoulder unless they have just been sent to five sessions of PT. And then when they stop, they never do it again. And then uh, they don't train the connective tissue involved in that movement at all. And, you know, th those things are all different types of training inputs. Like they all have a different, um, you know, like preferential way to be targeted and trained. So, you know, you get this question a lot of the times, like they, people watch you training these weird things with your shoulder. Like some of the connective tissue stuff is weird. The capsule stuff's a little weird. Weird because it's not familiar, that's all just another arbitrary exercise. Um, and they go, yeah, you're, wait, you're doing so much crap that looks useless and you just want to bench press. Like, why are you wasting all of your time on these other exercises, these prep exercises? And it's like, I'm training all of my shoulder, you know, like there's all of this stuff that you're neglecting and all of that Dog stuff it. is what blows up and gets injured in a training session because you just haven't trained it. Like you can't expect to load for a long period of time, a massive amount of tension into that musculature, ignoring the capsule, ignoring the support muscles in the shoulder, ignoring the connective tissue, you know, like that's all that's happening. So it's not stupid or a waste of time to train all of those components that are uh, part of what's happening there. It's, yeah. Well, there's just a lot of bad advice out there. I mean, I. I get a lot of that in my social media where it's like I'm training knee rotation and I'm just trying to squat. People are like, just fucking squat more because that's bending your knees. It's like, yeah, but like my knee in particular is missing this one really important thing that my knee does. Like I don't have that capsule tissue doing the knee stuff that it's supposed to. And I squatted for a lot of years with the knee pain and it didn't get any better by squatting. So clearly like there needs to be some other right. intervention there. It's just... Uh, it's, it's hard to get that message out though with, you know, 90, you get 90 seconds on Instagram to try to explain this whole system that, you know, we've been living in for like six, seven years now. And it's still, it's, it's vast. I mean, the, the, the hard part about it is that 
the more you learn about it, the, the more that you learn that the training world is so broad and there's so much stuff. It's like a giant gray area of what one person needs compared to another. And really to try to get even the same results, the approach is always a little bit different. So it's just, it's a lot and it's, you know, it's been developed by really, really smart people. And there's, there's a lot to, there's yeah. a lot to learn and implement. Yeah, it's beautifully simple in some ways. Like it is, it's simple, but it's also not simple. It's complex and the human body is complex and there's lots of different, um, you know, things are always changing and evolving too as you train. So it's not like you can just do something and get it done once and then keep it on maintenance. Like things are constantly, you know, coming up based off of your responses to training, things that weren't really anticipated. Like there's just, you know, it's a lot of, a lot of ins and outs, a lot of moving parts. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think, you know, obviously like we're in this world, so it's just something we've been thinking about and using for so long that it really just makes sense. But like that, that idea of when we think about training, all these things that we know for training, strength training and cardiovascular training and all of that stuff, that's like the, the approach is really like, this is making me a better human. It's making me a more capable human. And when you realize like that a lot of that stuff isn't really increasing those human qualities, it's increasing your ability to maybe do those specific things, but there's always a sacrifice to that, which is stuff that's, other stuff that's going away because your your body's just prioritizing how it all works based on the things that you're doing. It's funny that the there isn't a bigger recognition of like this training should be geared towards making a hip do really good hip stuff, only hip stuff. I think people are just confused about what good hip stuff is though. You know? Totally. I like, didn't have any idea about that. Back well, that's again, another, another difference between FRC and, you know, coming out of like the exercise world. Um, the exercise world basically grades the quality of a hip based on which exercises it can do rather than does it do hip movements, which is kind of funny that you never thought that. Like I just always cracked up the first exposure to that seminar because as soon as that gets turned around and asked to you in that way, you just feel like an idiot. It's like, uh, oh, I've never actually really figured out. What is the hip supposed to do? Well, yeah. How they, like, before you, th you never thought about that. Because it, it always is. Like, everything I've ever done, it's based on, well, can this person's body achieve a position? You know, like, can they achieve a split? Can they achieve a squat? Can they achieve a flat back, you know, good hip hinge deadlift? Yes or no. But what that isn't showing you or telling you, which was another thing that surprised the shit out of me, was just that, like, that doesn't actually tell you whether or not that person has a good hip capsule. And it's like, all right, well, I don't understand that. Well, a capsule is, you know, where these, it's the joint where things are meeting. And if there's space to move, there will be rotation, even in a hinge joint like the knee. Like it has to have freedom of movement to have that workspace. Without that workspace, there isn't a capsule. It's just this, it's too tight. You know, the things that come together are too tight. And so you always want to maintain and restore and have and, do stuff to train that capsule so that it's strong and that it's got that space there. And it's a simple assessment, but I didn't know how to assess that because I was assessing things based on what can it achieve a like? position. Yeah. But like, you know, what you can't see in that assessing a position is what's compensating. Like you can look at somebody having a perfect back squat. Like Grayson had a great squat. You know, he squatted was squatting for many, many years Half my life. <laughs> yeah, and then we went and saw, you know, good old Brian Fox. And, I mean, he, you figured out that you had a lot of problems at the seminar. But then especially when you go work hands-on with somebody that's really good, like Brian, where they're just like, oh, no, 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 look at, like, they, they're, they like, micro compensations. And it's like they can see, really, like, you have actually zero degrees of compensation-free hip internal rotation. It's like, really? Like, I've been squatting for all these years, and that really, that's just tightening that stuff up. But also, if you're not training hip IR the right way, you're not going to get more of it. <laughs> totally. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting, like, for the people out there who really feel like you don't need to do this stuff at this specific level, that you can just do more varied movement, you can do different kinds of squats and different kinds of hinging and stuff. When you actually get a little bit of time, like, doing cars, I mean, cars are cars if you don't know what they are it's basically just moving one joint in isolation through all of the range of motion that that joint has and this approach is really like looking at that and making all of those qualities really strong and developing them and that you know is is it's when you start thinking about it in those terms you realize like 
how much of the joint capacity is not being used when we're doing exercises, right? It's always a, per, a portion of them, but not all of them. But because your body is prioritizing what parts to maintain, it's getting a lot of information that it doesn't need to, to keep all of that stuff, which is why there's so many people out there who have a beautiful looking squat and a fucked up hip or some, a back that hurts every time they squat or whatever that is. Like I, I challenge you to go find anybody who's been working out long enough they probably have problems even though they've been doing stuff that's gotten them to a good level of fitness and strength and all of that. And there's, it's like, but why is that happening? Right? Like that's always this question. Like if everything does what it's, what we think it's doing, why does everybody have these problems when they're working out a lot? You know? Yeah. And I think it's because those problems are occurring at like untrained tissue levels that we're just not considering or not aware of. And I think that's again, going back to this, like, um, the joint independence thing in cars and specifically training certain tissues and not just positions, you know, so you could take the, take the approach of like, well, I'm just going to train all of these different like, uh, stretches to make sure that I'm really flexible. And then I should have a flexible capsule or, you know, enough space in my capsule and all this stuff. And it shouldn't be an issue, but a lot of these positions will cause compensation to be happening. If you're not specifically checking the independent function of that joint. So you could get yourself into a split with not a very good hip capsule, like which I had done for a really long time. Um, not knowing, you know, like it looks fine. Like you got into that position. How could you do that? Or how could you do a pigeon or whatever, you know, with not really a great hip capsule, blah, blah, blah. Um, because there's just compensation happening. So that's part of that reason of why we're so hyper picky about cars and assessments and being able to develop and display joint independence. Because if you have a hip that it, you know, it, it can kind of be a part of these positions and do these things. But when you ask it to specifically only do hip without, you know, it's buddies helping out, how well does that go? Like if you get that capsule isolated and, and see like, can you control this? Does it work? Is it even there? Or is the minute I start to even passively move you, does it dunk your pelvis? You know, then you really, when you specifically look at it, you see how that lack of movement is basically getting funneled away from where there isn't movement. And that's where there's this camp of folks that's like, bah, you don't need FRC or you don't need any of this mobility training, just go fucking play tennis and you're going to get better shoulders out of that. And it's like hilarious to me for a number of reasons, but especially on this micro level of like, I used to think that just training the positions was totally enough. But then when you start looking at that, like, but no, I can't, like, I can't actually isolate this. And that's important because the better I get at this, specific isolation of displaying the actual capsule as best that you know as I can or with my clients like that develops and builds and defines that thing and then it also allows you to specifically train it because if you can't isolate it and you can't move it and you can't control it you don't know where the fuck it is you're not training it you're training all this other shit that does work so movement funnels to where there's already movement you have to force it to go where it doesn't want to go. And like when you do a, a session with Brian, I am like blown, my brain is blown up. You know, like I can't deal with life for the rest of the day because it's just so neurologically challenging to try to move something that doesn't know it exists. Like it's a, it's amazing how hard it is. <laughs> it's hard. I mean, you know, uh, uh, one thing I really like about this is like if you're really training, like training should involve pursuing those things that you suck at, that you need more of, things that don't work well, right? Like. It's obviously easy to go to the route of training where you're like, I just keep doing these things that I'm good at. It makes my ego feel good, right? But this is like the purest version of that where you're looking at these parts of your body that are not doing these very important things and you're really trying to train those and it just takes a lot of specificity. Like I like the, the spine as an example. You know, like spine training is cool buzzword. Everybody's all about train, spine training now, which is dope because that's really important, but you know, a lot of the classic method for the people who are okay with flexing your spine and doing that stuff is people are like, well, I just need to do things like Jefferson curls. And if I'm rounding my spine, I'm training it to the level that it needs to be to work and be healthy and all that stuff. And like using that example of the, 
the load goes where parts work the best, you know, the spine's a great example of that because you're going to load the vertebrae that have the most movement, but almost everybody has a piece of their spine that doesn't move like the rest of those pieces. And what that means is that when you're globally moving your spine, if that's all you're doing is global movement, you're bypassing that area that doesn't move as well. It just doesn't have enough capacity. So your body's like, this part doesn't do shit. I'll load this part more. And what happens over time is that that part doesn't get the same adaptation that the rest of it does. So you further develop these weak links in the chain. And the only way to really target that is to train it specifically. And it's really humbling. Like you get people and they're like, I do Jefferson curls at double my body weight or whatever. They have a very strong Jefferson curl and you get them in there and look at your spine. And you're like, damn, but your lumbar spine, those last few vertebrae there, like they don't move at all. And so you're putting a ton of load into the vertebrae above that or the disc above that. And it's, it's, it's eye-opening to see that, but it's really like, that's just how our body works, right? Like yeah. it's going it, to... It'll compensate. It like it's to. not going to go where you think it's going. This, yeah, spines are so hard. Like it's, uh, it's hard to do on your own too. Like I have really... <laughs> you really feel like something's moving and then you video yourself or you feel, you know, have someone else like assess it and it's like, damn, it's still, it's so hard to get certain things moving that just don't want to move, which is why I'm excited for things like the back sink to, you know, hit the market. Cause it's just like having something that helps you. Cause it's so ridiculous. I mean, it's like having your own little personal coach there. Yeah. It just is like having something that provides that feedback that you can force yourself to train something like, it's hard, you know, you almost just need a buddy over a back sink to just constantly be there and like forcing that thing that doesn't move to move. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've filmed a video with back training stuff and I'm like, damn it, that spot that I said not to move that I was convinced was completely still is totally still doing most of the movement. Um, and it's just, it's, it's a very, it's very important to have feedback to make sure that the stuff that isn't moving is getting that, um, input that training because otherwise it just it won't like you're it'll just shift it up and down to avoid that spot and again like you were saying about the jefferson curl that's a, a thing to express your mobility it's not a good tool to, to, to develop it like yeah i mean you know again it comes into the, back to like the you know hanging like if you have really good control of your spine you don't have any really noticeable hinge points like you Maybe you were just blessed with a spine that moved well and you had a life where you used it a lot and you never lost anything. Like, yes, Jefferson curls can be a really good tool to utilize that mobility and maintain some of it and load it and all of that stuff. But um, again, like going back to the misconceptions about this, I think a lot of people see spine training and they're like, oh, you, can, you, know, you think that you can just do spine cars and you're gonna develop this spine that does everything that it needs to. And it's, it's not quite how it works. Like, we, we're constantly working on and checking back in with those fundamental movements of the spine and practicing those, especially when we're doing specific training to maybe increase movement where there wasn't movement before because you gotta go back in and make sure your brain understands how to use that spot that wasn't used at some point. But to really get your spine to move, if it doesn't have a lot of movement, it takes more than just trying to move it. You gotta passively stretch it and we load it. We start loading with isometrics. That's it's it's you know, very focused, intense work, at least we're building up to intense work over time. And that's really what it takes. And it's like, a, obviously a long process, like anything else. Like if you want to develop a really big back squat, you're going to spend lots of time squatting to get that squat up, just like you would need to do to make your thoracic spine extend more if you have really bad thoracic extension or something. Yeah. And it just always has to be a part of your training. Like that's what I also think is funny is the, you know, A, just the concept that it's completely unnecessary to develop range of motion and maintain range of motion such that you have more than you need a little more than you need for your sport and strength and conditioning in that sense would be considered a sport rather than like the training tool that's going to fix all of your problems because it again it's like a series of arbitrary exercises that do train certain things but they definitely don't train nearly everything and training everything is like that's the FRC or whatever. It's the other stuff that you have to figure out the function. Like what's it doing? What does it do? Does it do it? How do I train it? And you don't have a blueprint for that in strength and conditioning. Like there just isn't enough exercises to train everything. You have to make shit up. And like bodybuilders are probably closer to it in a lot of ways because they would obsess about like, 
I need a little more, you know, like I need some extra kind of movement that's going to get this other side of this muscle rather than just a straight up and down linear, you know, like this plane of movement is always enough for everything. It's not like your shoulder goes all over the place and should be able to be strong in all kinds of movements all over the place and not just in this little square. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just even the thing about like maintenance. I mean, you know, we definitely get comments from people who are like cars are a waste of time. Like, why are you doing cars? And it, you know, everybody's so focused on building more, getting stronger. We're pursuing all of these things. But when you really start to understand that, you, you know, you have to give your body stimulus to build. We know that, but your body needs stimulus to maintain shit. And if you're just working out every day, even if you're very creative about how you're training, you're using lots of range of motion. If you're not using all of the range of motion that's available, your body's not gonna maintain that. So even something like cars, which we tell people, do cars every day. You should tell your brain every day that it needs to maintain the tissue that you have because everybody understands that as we age, we lose stuff, but it's sort of like, it's like this weird disconnect where it's like magic. Like, I don't know, I just woke up at 40 and my back hurts and my knees hurt and all this stuff. And I, and, and woe is me because there's, I have no control over this. This is just how it is. That's just like many, many years where you didn't tell your brain that it needed to maintain all that stuff, which is just funny. Like that, that mindset of like maintain Maintain, maintain, yeah, do you know, all. I don't think we were all so put simple. here to take care of our bodies. Like, that's, like, not the main goal of evolution. <laughs> no. It's like, eh, this will get them to that stage, and then it'll, then it'll start to fall apart, whatever, who cares? They've had kids, they can be, you know, they're expendable now. But <laughs> <laughs> it's like, to actually, though, try to take care of, like, when you realize, like, what your body is, is it's like a, you know, a constantly adapting bundle of cells that's interacting with its environment, and wait, waiting for signals to tell it what to become, you know, and to continue to remanufacture itself and, you know, movement and force or whatever are, are like the main sort of communicators of like the function of what these cells are going to be doing when they renew themselves. Um, and we have input to that, you know, like we're responsible for communicating with our bodies and that's taking care of your body. It's basically like, Hey, what do you need? How are you doing? Like where, where are the issues? And, Hopefully you can learn to assess those things before they become a pain. You know, like a pain is basically a very old, very old voicemail from your body saying you fucked up 10 years ago, <laughs> you know, like, or you just completely ignored me for now, 10 years. Right now we're at this layer that is totally trashed from that shit you did. Um, but yeah, you got to take care of it and it all is constantly adapting. Like your tissues are adapting to your inputs and training is, you know, one of the biggest inputs. And it's also like, you know, what people are realizing as far as longevity, it's one of the biggest, it is right now, the biggest thing we know of that you can do to increase your health span and all these things. So again, like you have to train all of those tissues. And so I've probably mentioned this before, but we'll get that thing from folks when they start doing our training and they're like, God, there's so much prep and mobility, like just to get to the last 15 seconds of this fucking workout, like then that, that's the workout at the end of it. And it's only because they recognize those exercises as strength training and they're comfortable driving all of that neurological tension or input, you know, into that, exercise whereas the other stuff they're just like ha ho hum like not paying attention like just bored out of their minds because it's not an exercise they're familiar with but again too like there's this novelty like when you force those tissues that don't move to start moving like that's new stuff like that in itself creates novelty in that system and it changes your training, you know, like you have more tissue to train, you have more tissue that you can use that can then output into whatever it is you're trying to get more out of. Like there's this constant interplay and dance with that, um, new, you know, creation of space that is beneficial to those last 15, you know, <laughs> 15 minutes of the workout that you think is the only thing that's the workout. Yeah. Is that the intent? Is that the buzzword we should use today? The intent? Intent yes. matters? Yeah. It does, even though it's played out now. But you just gotta, you gotta train all the stuff, like, and, and go ahead and come up with a system that does it. Great. Like, these guys came up with a system that does it, and it's wonderful, because it's got a built-in assessment, 
that assesses the specific the specific stuff like the independence not just the positions because the positions only tell you so much they only tell you if you can do a position so they've got the assessment they've got a, and then they have a systematic way of okay well what do you gain from the assessment what does this person need based on their goals do they have enough if they don't have enough they have to that's a, a prerequisite there you need to establish that first so there's just a nice system and it, it isn't um, again yeah it's not inventing anything at all it's just looking at everything and saying well if this is the information then why aren't we doing it this way and it makes a lot of sense you know and then so it's and it works <laughs> great yeah. but yeah go ahead and come up with another system and it's fine yeah but don't say that you don't need to train all this stuff because you unfortunately do like it's well yeah I mean, I, but I think a lot of people that are out there that hate on the systems in general I mean I I totally understand why people hate on systems because there is a lot of that vibe of like this is better than everything else you should do this don't do anything else we want your money you know like there's a lot of bad connotations with with the system i mean we've yeah we've seen it but it's also <laughs> not a system in the sense that it isn't like it isn't some totally new thing it's just kind of like it's not how to make these components work well, with what you're doing it's and, like so simple that way it's not like some other little like system of exercise that's got its own funny little equipment and its own funny little whatever, yeah. you know? I mean, yes, there's terms and language and all that stuff, but like it's the only system that's not telling you to stop doing whatever you want to do. It's like, it's encouraging you to do that. It's just trying to help you find a, a way that you can make that sustainable and really, really make it optimal. Like, th you know, like it's, we always use the example of like training involves a lot of sacrifices. This is the most sacrifice free way to train because it shows you how you can go pursue those goals, whatever they may be. You want to go do a double body weight Jefferson curl? That might be silly for a lot of people, but it shows you what you need to do to be able to do that. You want to be an Olympic weightlifter? Well, there's things that you need to do to be able to do that outside of just weightlifting, which is cool. Like that unbiased approach is really appealing because everything else is like, that's bullshit. That's bullshit. This is the best. And if you're doing any of that stuff, you're wrong. This is like, it's not ever saying that you're wrong. It's like, this is right, but this can make it better. Yeah. That's cool. And it's also about understanding like how, um, the sports and activities that you're doing are affecting your body. Like sport, you know, especially done at high levels, isn't healthy for you. Like it's funny because a lot of people would like to think that like doing CrossFit or, you know, doing you know, the sport of fitness. Um, baseball, whatever, like, oh, they're active, it's healthy. It's like, nah, 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 they're doing the same thing. Like they're getting really, really good at throwing that ball. And so, you know, what we're trying to do is go in and say, well, what is that doing to your shoulder? And then how can we train on the other end and not just continue to retrain the stuff that you're already training, which is another huge mistake that a lot of um, people that cross train athletes make where it's like, they don't need to do more of the same stuff. They need to look at like what's, I mean, sometimes there's a support thing that does need to happen, but a lot of it is that they need to help, you need to figure out how to help them not have that sport destroy them so that when they're done playing that sport, they have, still have a shoulder, you know? Or so they can play a long time. I mean, the if you think about what what are the problems that arise when people are training, like it's internally related problems, right? They tore some connective tissue. They have a frozen shoulder. I mean, those are extreme examples, but like all of those internal things are become the limiting factors. It makes so much sense that training needs to focus on those internal qualities, right? Like that just is so, what, I mean, I never would have probably figured that out on my own. I would have just kept doing what I was doing, you know, more squats to make my hips stronger. Um, well, yeah, you can manipulate those internal elements you know like well just like just by looking at them and saying okay well what are these internal elements and like what are they responding to because they've gotten to the place that they're at whether it's good or bad based responding to what's coming at them from the environment so if you instead of just sit there and kind of passively go well, i'm going to pick this thing to do and then see what the response is and like oh yeah overall the response from yoga was good but like instead just look at how do i manage these internal yeah, because it really is all the same. I mean, we're so we're so accepting and used to seeing like muscular training. Everybody understands that you can make your muscles stronger when you lift weights, but all that other tissue in our body responds to the same mechanisms. But 
In slightly different ways. In slightly different ways, but it can all be trained just like your muscles can be trained to be stronger or stretchier or whatever you want them to do. Yeah, a, f- a few degrees range of motion and, and different time elements might be the only thing that's keeping you from training your connective tissue. Like it's just, you know, it needs to be at length <laughs> or yeah. two length. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I. A whole lot of at length, two length. Well, that's right. It's all about that at length, two length. Um, it's tough though, because, you know, relating to like trying to get this message out. I mean, we need to sit and talk about it in front of our phone for 45 minutes so we can explain it a little bit more. But like, you know, I make a post where I'm doing some crazy zercher spine bending stuff, and it's always hard when people ask questions like, is, should I be doing this for my back? Like, is this good? Sh- 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 would you recommend just doing this with lighter weight? You know, it's like, man, this is... People get confused. It's confusing. It's hard. It's hard to see that. And it's hard, you know, mentally I'm torn when I post that stuff because I want to show it because I, of course, I'm proud of being able to do it. Um, but it is a little bit misleading because it's like, I'm saying this is spine training and currently the level that I'm, I've gotten my spine to do is that can be considered training for it. Um, but it's not a good example of what it took to get there. You know, it's like, it really is. Well, there's, again, it's, it's, it's back into that, that camp of like things that develop mobility and things that express mobility, you know, and things that you train to make your tissues healthier and better and stronger and able to put up with shit like a zerker, <laughs> zercher, um, that, that people get confused about that. Like they look at exercises and their brain automatically says they're doing this exercise to be healthy, to train. You know, like that's how people's concepts of all this stuff work rather than like, no, like a lot of these exercises are not really going to contribute significantly to your health. It's just like they want to do stuff like all this like fun strongman stuff. I mean, it's functional in a lot of ways because it is picking heavy things up and moving them from place to place. And some of it, though, is just arbitrary. It's like how strong is your body to be able to withstand this thing? You know, they're tests of how well trained your body is. But people do get confused and they think like, oh, well, that he's doing that. He's rounding his back. He's doing that to train his back and make it better at rounding. It's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> That's not what I'm doing. <laughs> totally. I'm doing this other training of all these posts that you didn't look at or read because they looked really boring <laughs> so that I can do this thing. Yeah. Yeah. But it's a hard message. Well, at least we can sit around and talk about it here. Yeah. For those people who want to watch. Well, anyways, I can't, I mean, are there any other things you can think of that people kind of talk flack? They, they think it's PNF, which isn't PNF, because PNF is totally different than pails and rails. I mean, there's a similarity, but there's not a... You don't have the regressive component. It's, you know, long, there's, there's just, it's a lot... The intensity isn't there. Like, you're not, for, you're not causing an adaptation really at a point because there, you don't, PNF isn't the intensity. It's just kind of like a little puff. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you're... A little you, trick for neurological tightness that, that has a Totally. Small and not that you don't get a benefit from that, but it this is not like... Not a lingering training effect that's going to produce long-term change. Yeah. And it's, I mean, and anyway, within that, the system of FRC, though, like, that could be one thing that you do, that kind of, you know, repeated contraction on length and tissue, but that's not the only thing, right? So it's just a lot more, it's a lot more developed to incorporate... All of the stuff, passive stretching, isometrics, eccentrics, um, and, and then really applying those at specific parts of how the body works. Like maybe it's just hip rotation or maybe it's geared towards developing more capsule space. So over time that hip joint has more room to move around. Or maybe you're applying those same principles now to an actual pattern movement like a squat or a deadlift. I mean, all those, they can all be put in at those different levels of what you're trying to get to. It literally is just helping you organize what is the priority first. Well, you want to have a big deadlift and a big squat. You need a healthy hip joint. You need a healthy spine. If you don't have those, that should be part of the training. And then you can just keep <laughs> Can't directing the training. Can't guarantee how that deadlift's going to go if you don't have those components. Yeah, I mean, I know what it's like to squat heavy and deadlift heavy with a shitty hip and a bad knee. and Or when I say bad, like lacking some very fundamental functions. I got really strong. I had, you know, I, I mean, strong for me, I had like a... 410 pound back squat and no right hip at all and I got strong and I lifted weights a lot and did CrossFit and all that stuff and it's not that I didn't have I didn't achieve the performance that I was going for but I definitely didn't achieve the way that I wanted my body to feel 
you yeah. thought you were training your body to be healthier, like totally from you know surface to yeah. Bones. And so now, I mean, the perspective is I, I am stronger than I was mostly because I've just been training for that many more years. But it is a wild difference to have a body that actually really feels good and isn't limited. And I can still train that way and be strong and do the weird stuff that I want to do. Like that's really, that's appealing. Yeah. And there's also like people look at it and they go, oh, that's just mobility, like flexibility training, like stretchy type stuff. But a lot of it is that end range training, you know, where you're training your tissues at the shortest and the longest range because most strength training is like a whole lot of mid range strength where you're just kind of pumping in this capacity this you know narrow capacity um so you're missing basically money you're leaving money on the table by ignoring like these other ends that you can also train to be really strong which then will just kind of contribute to that middle piece um and it also does kind of bump up that hypertrophy and strength potential so it's good to have more access to more tissue to train more options more you don't have access to it you can't train it you know if you can't move it if you can't move it you can't train it you know these are spina's words not mine but brilliant though true why don't you think about that if you can't fucking move something you're not training it like and so if you go through this you know spine training for example and there's huge chunks that are not moving they're not contracting like they're not there's some you know global stabilization yeah that's happening around them but there's not like the actual mechanisms and stuffs in there are not getting you know that that good juicy new supportive tissue that you want yeah i mean literally your brain could not even be aware that that's a part of your spine <laughs> you know, yeah it's not that's, there that's how it goes yeah you don't move your big toe ever independently of your other toes your brain does not even understand that you have a big toe which is you have a hoof crazy yeah like a map like that neurological map of like what your brain thinks your body looks like yeah. It's what it, it's what it gets information from and if it doesn't go back and forth that information then you're not you're not getting that. Yeah, cars can be they can seem kind of silly and arbitrary but like the the specifics of of that um really being able to move and isolate something and getting better and better at that and really focusing as you do those things like it it does have it seems silly, but it really does have huge benefit. Also, what I've noticed too, with doing the cars interspersed through the different um, tissue layers is really interesting because of how different the cars feel after each of those inputs. And again, that's just like, the more information that you can give your brain about a joint, which is when you're really t trying to touch every piece of that capsule through all these different positions, you're sending information to your brain about that capsule and so some of us haven't touched like this whole section hasn't been touched in years you know so um that's where uh you know that that stuff does become important it seems insignificant but it gives your brain a more accurate picture of that tissue and that joint so that it can respond more accurately to like how it helps that joint feel and deal with stuff like if it's going to not understand how the shoulder works because it hasn't seen it it's going to be tight. You're going to have tension. It's not going to be easy going. But if it sees it regularly and it knows what you're doing because you're constantly showing it the shoulder in various states, it's like, oh, you know, yeah, has better back and forth information. Yeah. I mean, when they talk about that, you know, your brain is in a sealed canister. It is inside a vault that is not accessible by anything except hearing touching, moving, smelling, that's it. Like it's Input. completely isolated. <laughs> Input, exactly, yeah. Just keep thinking of uh, number five. Number five alive. <laughs> you um, need input. Yeah, I mean that, that thing, like how you move your shoulder and what your shoulder is able to do from a movement perspective is literally your brain's understanding of what that joint is and where it is in space. So if you have this limited understanding, how well is that shoulder gonna deal with pull-ups and bench press and all that stuff? Probably, it's probably gonna be limited in some way. Not even probably 100% guaranteed, right? Yep. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I don't know if I have anything else to say about this. No, that's good. We should go. I got to go work out. I do my own joint training and lift some shit. <laughs> surprise, right. surprise. Yeah.